Good to go. Okay. The meeting will come to order. Let the roll call show that we have all board members present. Um, Mr. Sar is attending virtually, but everybody from the board is here. This afternoon, we have Chris from ASLA here to conduct a training for us in Arizona's open meeting law and uh, also some select governing board policies. Chris, thank you for being with us today. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. And I, I just I need to start off first off by sort of apologizing for a second. It, that is um, sometimes when you do this a lot, and I think I was counting this is my 12th open meeting law presentation since the beginning of the year. Um, you go to the last one you did and you sort of just change the name of the front because the title, you know, the, the presentation didn't change. Well, in this case, the presentation did change. We're just doing open meeting law today. The, uh, the board policies part, was, that was for Deer Valley. So I apologize for that. Um, I've, I've, uh, on the presentation that I have in front of me, I've changed it and I will send you a, a revised copy when we're done. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we'll get started with the open meeting law. Um, and uh, you know, it, in doing these virtually, um, I find that it's best to sort of, um, you know, uh, if you could take notes of questions of things you might wanna ask, and we sort of save them to the end. Um, that that works best, I think, just because of uh, you know having the the changing um, uh, j just because of w moving back and forth between screens and things like that. So, um, okay. So with that, uh, we'll, let's get started. So, and this is going to work for me. There we go. So the first thing is, and I and I like to say that when when I do an open meeting law presentation, I try to break it into twelve rules that if you understand those 12 rules, you really understand everything you need to know about the open meeting law. And our first rule is knowing why the law exists to begin with. Because if you do understand that, it's gonna be a lot easier to apply and to interpret the law later on. And the reason it exists is it, it it's intended to bring the public into the process or at least the, the ability to observe uh, the deliberation and the decision-making um, being done by their elected representatives on their behalf. Um, it's one of our two sunshine laws, the uh, public records law being our other sunshine law. And again, it's, it's, it's the idea is that, you know, when, when government is um, done in the public, uh, where the public can scrutinize it, um, that is a, a better situation um, because it, um, it, it allows the public to, under, to have confidence in the decisions being made on their behalf. Um, so the law concerns itself really with the public interest and not, you know, the interest of board members or school employees or, or anybody else sometimes is affected by the law. And I'll often hear this is that, boy, that open meeting law sometimes makes it more difficult for us to do, um, uh, you know, our jobs. And, and, and I think it slightly does, but at the same time, um, it's one of those things that we have to do to make sure that we have the public trust, um, which is important. Um, when you're doing the public's business. The second rule is to know when the open meeting law applies um, because our, our law is a little different. What we do in, uh, in, in the open meeting law is we define what a meeting is. And if the elements that are you know, defined in what a meeting is are present, then you've got a meeting. And then the question of course is, do you have a legal meeting or an illegal meeting um, you have a legal meeting only if you're following all the open meeting law requirements. So what is a meeting under the open meeting law? Well, an open, the, uh, a meeting is um, when you have a, a gathering of a quorum of board members of the public body, and it applies to all public bodies in this state, uh, including school boards. And a quorum, of course, and a five-member board is going to be three members. Uh, it also includes um, subcommittees. So we'll get to that in a second, but if a, if a board creates a subcommittee of the board on board motion or through board policy, that subcommittee also has to follow the open meeting law. Um, a quorum can be constituted, not just a majority of those that are, are you know, present in the same physical location at the same time, but it could be, um, you know, where it's, it's uh, you know, you have a quorum created 
over conference calls or Zoom or, um, you know, even a series of conversations that are not taking place at the same time, um, if it's about the same thing, could violate the open meeting law as well. Email also can trigger the open meeting law requirements as well. So physical proximity is not required in order to create that quorum requirement. So um, the other thing that's required is not just a quorum, but it's, you also have to be talking about something that is board business. And what is board business? Well, it's anything that could come before the board. It's not just on the next agenda or some future agenda. It's anything that the board could conceivably address. So if it's basically school business, school district business, and you have a quorum talking about it, that's going to be construed as board business. And you'll meet the have you'll have the second component of the open meeting law, because you could have a gathering of a quorum of, of board members, and if they're not talking about board business, um, even though it doesn't look great, it's not a violation of the open meeting law. So if you you, you know remember that second category as well. Uh, we could also trigger a meeting under the open meeting law if it's a one way communication electronic communication by one member of the public body proposing legal action to a quorum of board members. This could happen over many different play, uh, ways. This could happen over an email. This could happen in a group text. This could happen over social media. If you have one board member saying to a quorum of board members, I think we should do this, or I, you know, I propose we do this the next time we get together. Um, that's a violation for that individual board member in proposing legal action to a quorum of board members. Um, there's the issue of email is uh, one where um, it's a great tool um, for getting out information to the board. It's a great tool for board members to be able to ask questions about um, you know, meeting materials and things like that. But what you need to understand is when you use email, um, you could violate the open meeting law inadvertently if there's discussion amongst a quorum of board members or again, if any one board member follows that with um, some uh, proposal for legal action. So just be careful about how you use email. Um, a good um, idea is to, uh, you know, when you're with the superintendent sending out an email to the full board to, to put all the board member email addresses on the blind copy, and then in the body say it's going to all board members. So you don't have that reply all problem because it's really easy with reply all to inadvertently violate the open meeting law. So um, you can also have, a, and this is uh, talking about uh, what we call a serial conversations problem, where you have a series of one-on-one -on -one discussions, which one board member can talk to another board member about an issue that's board business and not violate the open meeting law. But if they then go to talk to a third board member, um, say board member you know, A and B have this conversation and then board member B goes and talks to board member C about the very same subject. Well, we've strung together a quorum of board members um, in, in, in talking about board business and that uh, they may very well uh, violate the open meeting law, particularly if it's been designed to sort of circumvent, um, you know, having a public discussion. Um, I get this call a lot, superintendents, um, it's, it's uh, a good idea for superintendents to meet with board members in ones or twos and talk about, you know, things that are on the board member's mind, inform them about what's going on in the district, all those kinds of things. It's not a violation of the open meeting law to do that. It is a violation of the open meeting law if there is, um, you know, uh, securing of uh, an approval for something outside of a public meeting. In other words, um, if a superintendent says to a board member, look, I'm ready to go forward with this proposal. I think we're ready, but we need to make sure that all the board's on board before we do it. Um, I need to know if you are. And if you, you know, they had a similar conversation with the rest of the board, that's polling the board. And that would be a violation of the open meeting law, not only for the superintendent, um, but also for those board members that are involved. Um, and then board members can't, you know, likewise utilize staff um, to communicate with other board members if that communication would be a violation of the open meeting law. Um, this is a kind of a spoken wheel kind of thing. And if that's the case and then that happens, it's a violation for both the board member and the staff member. 
So just remember um, these rules that I'm talking about in terms of what a meeting is and, and the requirements for the meetings that I'm going to talk about in a minute. It applies to all meetings of the board, no matter what you call them. And we do have a lot of different kinds of meetings in school boards. We have, you know, we have work study sessions and retreats and information sessions and public hearings and regular meetings and special meetings, and the list goes on and on. For the purposes of the open meeting law, however, you just have one meeting, one meeting that requires all the requirements of the open meeting law. So in other words, if you have a retreat or a work study session, you still have to have an agenda that meets the same requirements that even a regular session meeting would have. And you still have to stick to that agenda. Um, it could be usually the, it's broader topics um, to allow us for more, you know, broader conversation, but you still have to stick to the overall topic. Um, remember that it applies to subcommittees. And so know that if you, if you do create a subcommittee that the open meeting law is going to have to follow uh, with that subcommittee. And by the way, this is different than a subcommittee or, or a committee that the, the superintendent may create um, on their own without being directed by the board. If they create a, a, a sub a, a committee to get input about a decision, and then that recommendation is then brought to the board, that is not a subcommittee that has to follow the open meeting law because it wasn't created by the board on the motion of the board. It was created actually by the superintendent. So it's considered an administrative committee. Um, and then remember, it's not just about anything that's on a pending agenda, but anything that could, be, could become before the board in terms of what the, uh, the content requirement is. And then um, the final piece of advice is watch the, uh, the parking lot. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, uh, board members congregating around each other's cars after the meeting's over um, and people drive by and they assume that you're talking about board business. You might not be. Um, but, you know, you try to avoid those kind of situations where people assume um, something's going wrong, uh, going on that is not. So our third rule then is uh, that uh, board meetings have to comply with uh, this logistical requirements of the law, which is, you know, the location of your meetings, um, the notice when you're going to have a meeting, the agenda that we talked about before um, in terms of what you're going to talk about at the meeting and then the minutes, which is the memorialization of the meeting. So your location um, should be in a public facility in the district. It has to be accessible to the public, including the disabled and, and large enough for the public to attend and to listen. You can move um, a, a meeting to a, di a, a location, um, maybe in a school site or um, you know, a, a bigger um, venue to accommodate a large crowd. Uh, just make sure that it's, you know, taking care of all the, uh, you know, technical requirements to make sure that everybody can hear each other uh, and that you can capture uh, what happens there because you will have to have minutes uh, for those meetings. Um, you can have a meeting off district premises, uh, but you cannot take legal action if you're not in a public facility in the district. So um, there are boards that often take, you know, have retreats and things like that in the summer for planning purposes that's okay but know that it is some it is a, still a public meeting and that you cannot take legal action at that meeting so your notice uh legally you have to provide notice um that tells the public um you know you're going to be having a meeting and actually there's two two requirements of this notice requirement one is you have to post on your website um, where you're going to post your notices which includes your website, but also includes a physical posting place. And then the second requirement, of course, in the notice is that you post, um, you know, at least 24 hours in advance in those two locations uh, and then provide written notice to all board members at least 24 hours in advance as well. Where this becomes a big deal is when we get to the agenda and changes that may happen in, uh, you know, on the agenda. We'll talk about that in a minute. But notice is basically saying we're having a meeting. Um, it's different than the agenda, which says, here's what we're going to talk about at that meeting. Um, uh, the law also encourages you to inform your public in a manner that they say is reasonable and practical that goes beyond your basic notice requirements. Um, but we urge you to not define those as your, you know, your, your basic notice. Um, because the one issue you wanted to make sure is if, is if you say on your, on your, uh, your website, we're going to um, post our notice when we're going to have a meeting in the follow, following six locations. 
and you miss one, then you have defective notice. So keep it simple, right outside the district office and on your website. Um, agenda, uh, that's posted and distributed with your notice and it lists specifically the items that you're gonna talk about at your meeting. What you wanna make sure you are careful about with your agenda are two things. One, first of all, that everything is su sufficiently described in a manner that somebody off the street can understand it. Uh, that's the standard that the attorney general will use if somebody alleges that you violated the open meeting law because you sort of um, were not specific enough on your agenda items. The second thing you're gonna need to make sure that you do is, is if you split out your agenda items into those things that are just gonna be, um, you know, uh, where just information is gonna be given or things that are action items, you need to make sure that you, if you, um, you've listed something just for information or that's just for discussion only, you know that you're, you're limited to just doing that at the meeting. You can't take action after, after you've noticed everybody that you're going to just discuss or get information about something, okay? So just make sure that you, whatever flexibility you need is covered in that agenda. Um, you're limited to those topics that are on the agenda and other things that are directly related to those items. So what you wanna make sure is that you don't bird walk on the topics that are completely not even related to the uh, agenda items that, that have been stated. Um, it's one thing to say, if you're talking about recruiting board, uh, you know, bus drivers, um, you know, are we, uh, are, are we um, doing everything we can to, um, to advertise the position and are, are the requirements that we, you know, we have similar to other districts. Those are related agenda items that you can talk about. What you can't talk about is, um, you know, well, you know, we could pay the bus drivers more if we didn't spend money over here. And then you start talking about that other agenda item and that other issue. Um, that would not be something that's on the agenda. And you want to make sure you reel it back in to just those items that appear on the agenda. And we'll talk about executive sessions in, in a bit. So minutes, you do have to have minutes. Um, uh, those can be in a written form and that's the common um, way of doing it, but you can also record your meetings and, and have those uh, you know, cover uh, the minutes as well. Um, the written minutes have to be available three working days after your meeting. They have to have um, you know, certain elements in them, uh, the date, time, and place of the meeting, which members were present or absent, a general description of all matters considered, in uh, a uh, description of every legal action proposed, including who made the motion, who seconded the motion, and um, the vote, uh, very specifically um, how each member voted on the motion. And then all the names of persons who made statements are presented to the board. So that's another reason why if somebody, you know, comes to the call of the public, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, that you make sure that they state their name for the record, because that's going to be in the minutes. Um, there is no requirement to approve your minutes under the open meeting law, although uh, our policy, our model policy, which I think you have, um, does require the public body to approve the minutes. We think that's a good practice to make sure that they are accurate, but the open meeting law itself does not require uh, approval. Um, the minutes have to be available to public inspection within three working days, as I mentioned, and you could, you know, mark draft on them, even if they, you know, if they have not been approved by the, the uh, by the board that's okay. Or you can um, have a recording of the sessions as well and have people listen to that. And we'll talk about exec sessions in a minute. So our fourth rule is that you basically have to, to consistently follow your rules for your meeting, um, including a beginning of a calling the meeting to order. So we know what, what time the meeting started. You follow all the open meeting law and your board policies. And you know, your board policies can go beyond the open meeting law, but they, you know, the open meeting law sort of sets the floor. Um, you cover all the items on the agenda and you can table things. Um, you can also change the order unless you set on the agenda, you're gonna talk about something at a specific time, although we don't recommend that. Um, and you cover only those items on the agenda. You ask speakers to identify themselves um, and then you formally adjourn your meeting. So 
you sort of have a beginning, a middle, and an end there. And your public has a right to expect you um, to, to do that, to follow that. Um, so what are citizens' rights in the open, under the open meeting law? Um, what's surprising to a lot of people when they learn about the open meeting law is that there isn't embedded in the open meeting law the right to citizen participation other than to observe and to attend um, whatever public participation is allowed by the public body is up to the public body uh, to determine. Um, and we like it that way because, not because we don't want public participation, but because every district is different, every culture is different, and it gives you flexibility to, to craft reasonable policies um, for the participation at your meetings. Um, under the open meeting law, the, the, as I mentioned, the citizens have the right to attend and to listen. They have the right to record you. Um, and in these days where we're having a lot of virtual meetings, they have the right to obviously see that happening in real time. Um, they have the right to expect you to follow your own rules. Uh, and then they have the right to address the public body if your policy allows for it. Otherwise, there's no right to participate. So the sixth rule uh, pertains to an open call to the public. And uh, just a couple definitions that we need to be aware of here. One is you can have a call to the public, which is a limited call to the public, which is inviting the public to give input on any item appearing on the agenda. Or you can have what we call an open call to the public, where the public is invited not only to, um, you know, bring up an item that's on the agenda, but basically any item that is within the jurisdiction of the school district. What the board needs to understand and, and what you need to impart to your public in this process is that making them understand that if they raise an issue that's not on the agenda, that you cannot talk about it, you cannot discuss it, you cannot make a decision about it, it's gotta be on that night's agenda. So, um, and that's challenging sometimes, and I'm sure you experienced board members have, have, have uh, experience this, which is that, you know, somebody comes to the board, they, they very much want to talk about it. Um, you, you're sympathetic with what they're having to say, but it's not on the agenda. And all you can do is just say, thank you very much. Um, and then let them know that you're, you're precluded from um, dealing with the matter there and then. Um, so what you can do, though, is ask the staff to review the matter um, and get with that person to deal with their concerns. You can ask that it be put on a future agenda for discussion. Um, there's also a provision in the law that allows the board at the conclusion of the call of the public to respond to any personal criticism that were made um, uh, by those that, you know, uh, uh, that address the board. I, I urge, always use urge to use people. I always urge boards to use this sparingly uh, because it, one, it tends to escalate the situation. Um, I would really only use it to correct the record if something was said that was inaccurate or that you felt needed a response. And then I would be very careful about just limiting it to, to that uh, one criticism or correcting that record. Um, understand that by, uh, you know, if you do have a public participation policy, you've created what we call a, you know, a first amendment forum for, um, the, and, and, you know, you can't, uh, block somebody's um, comment because you don't like its point of view. Um, that's protected under the First Amendment to the Constitution. But you can adopt what we call reasonable time, place, and manner regulations, which means that you can say, okay, we're, we're going to allow for two minutes a speaker, or we're going to only allow for uh, you know an hour of public comment, and then we're going to get to the rest of the items on the agenda. Um, these, these days where people are submitting their comments in writing because we're still doing a lot of virtual meetings, you can have a word count that's, you know, so that people understand that you're only going to read, um, you know, something submitted that has so many words in it, or, you know, you're going to read it for three minutes and then you're going to cut them off, whichever. Um, those are all reasonable time, place and manner restrictions provided that you apply them uniformly and fairly across the board. And uh, what you, what you don't want to have is where the public thinks you're sort of making up the rules as you go. Uh, the rules ought to be well stated and followed consistently and well articulated uh, and communicated. 
Um, superintendent and board reports. Um, there is a provision in the open meeting law that allows for a superintendent or any member of the governing board to give a summary of current events without that those issues being listed on the agenda. Um, it's sort of a carve out of the exception that everything that's discussed at the on the uh, at the board meeting has to be on the agenda. Um, but there are a couple restrictions. One is that nobody can talk about it. Uh, so there's no follow up questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, there's no follow up questions. Um, there's no, um, you know, uh, there can be no discussion on it whatsoever. Um, and you have to have the uh, summary that uh, on the agenda that it was going to be given. What you can do, just like with the open call, the public is asked um, for the item to be put on a future agenda or ask for that information, you know, additional information about that. And the other thing that is really important about this is to understand what it's designed for. When I say a summary of current events, that's really what it's designed to be. It's, um, you know, if, a, if you're a board member, it might be that you attended a training and you want the rest of the board to know about, or you attended a great student event and you wanted to give a shout out to those involved. Um, if you're the superintendent, you, you know, quick updates about things that the board is generally not going to want to discuss, staff recognitions, um, student recognitions, those kinds of things not you know big substantive things that the board's going to want to talk about those items need to appear on the agenda also know that because we've carved out this exception for superintendents and board members that other uh, individuals cannot um, follow this same rule in other words if you have a you know a budget report or a transportation report um, you're going to have to list on the agenda what is going to be contained in that report not just have budget report or superintendent report, okay? Um, again, no discussion and only board members or superintendents can give that uh, without listing the items on the agenda. The easiest thing to do by far, especially if you're a superintendent, is if you know you're gonna talk about these three things and you know when it did that those in advance before the agenda is posted, is just to bullet those items underneath your your uh, report. That way you have flexibility to actually answer questions um, by the board members if they have them. Uh, executive sessions, um, we'll, let's get into those because that is a big part of the open meeting law. And it is um, one of those areas where we're saying, okay, these are this is a discussion that can happen outside of public view because believe it or not, we believe the public interest is best served that by not having a public discussion. And so the legislature has chosen nine different areas where you can have an executive session. An executive session is by definition, a gathering of a quorum of members for which the public has been excluded. But there are certain procedural requirements. Before you have an executive session, you have to call your meeting to order before a motion is made to go into an executive session a majority of those that are present have to vote uh, in the affirmative to go into an executive session. Then um, also the, the notice um, that you were going to go into executive session has to be on the agenda with a specific statutory legal basis for doing so. Um, you also need to describe uh, that, you know, what that session's about without defeating the purpose of why it's going to be done in an executive session to first, in the first place. And then the board, again, a member uh, has to agree by uh, a majority of those present. During your executive session, only those individuals who have a purpose in there should be there. Um, that is typically your board members, um, the superintendent, and anybody else who has a specific reason. Um, what you don't want to have is all the board and all of the superintendent and the cabinet in each and every meeting. Um, there's a, that's a lot of people that probably don't need to be there. So um, uh, I would make sure that you're, you're following that. Secondly, um, everybody needs to be reminded each and every time that what happens in an executive session is confidential and cannot be disclosed to anyone. Um, and you have to put that in the minutes, by the way, that that admonition was read before the executive session really got started. Uh, and of course, the big thing is that you can't take any legal action in an executive session with one exception that we'll get to in a second. Um, 
you know, there's no straw poll or preliminary votes prior to deciding the matter in open session. And then after the executive session is uh, over, then, you know, your final voter decision is an open session. Um, you actually even end the executive session by reconvening an open session. There is a, um, a provision that allows you to give instructions to a third party in executive session in a few different instances. One is if you're involved in litigation or settlement discussions. Um, two is if you're in negotiations with your employee organizations, like you know, you're, maybe you're doing a meet and confer kind of process. And then if you're involved in real estate, um, whether it's buying or selling or leasing it, um, you can have that discussion in an executive session and instruct your the person working on your behalf, hey, we're interested in buying this for up to this price. And obviously you wouldn't want to have that discussion in open session because as I mentioned, um, you know, the public interest in the price being, um, you know, not known is, is great. So another example of why we're serving the public interest by having it out of public view. Um, and then you consider continue with the remainder of your meeting after uh, the executive session concludes. So here's the nine authorized reasons for having an executive session. Um, one is to discuss certain employee matters. Uh, two is to get legal advice from your attorney. The third is to uh, discuss records that may be exempt from public inspection. Um, student records certainly fall into that category. You may have certain personnel records that are also there, uh, confidential. If you're involved in contract negotiations or pending litigation or settlement discussions, if you're giving instruction to your negotiating representative, if you're involved in any sort of international or any interstate negotiations. Now that may seem far-fetched, but in many school districts, especially if you have around your jurisdiction, um, tribal land where you're dealing with the tribal government that would apply so that you could have those conversations in the executive session. And I know Fountain Hills does um, have tribal land real close nearby. Um, purchase a uh, sale or uh, a lease of real property, as I mentioned before, and then two that were added uh, last year, um, school safety operation plans or programs and security plans or, uh, 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 or services. Keep in mind that school safety operations were designed for like emergency response plans, um, things like active shooter drills, um, evacuation plans, those kind of things that you wouldn't wanna have those discussions in open session because it would defeat the purpose. Um, a lot of discussion happened this year about, well, we're we're, we want to talk about COVID. So can we use that school safety exception to have a, an executive session discussion? My advice was not to, um, because I think those were, those discussions were of high public import. And um, I didn't think that uh, understanding what the school safety exception was intended to be, um, I did not recommend that people utilize that exception for COVID dis related discussions, unless there was something, you know, um, sensitive in terms of confidentiality about that. Um, employee matters. This is, is, is you know, um, probably by far the most common executive session that you will have on a school board. A um, couple things to keep in mind is you need to be just talking about a, a, an employee, not a position, um, mean, meaning that you need to be talking about an identified person. Uh, whereas if you're talking about, say, reducing you know, custodians, um, you know, the ratio of custodians to square footage or something like that. That's not an executive session discussion. That's an open session discussion because you're not talking about an individual employee. Um, if you are talking about an individual employee, you have to deliver written notice to that employee at least 24 hours in advance. The employee then can decide to have that discussion in public. The employee though has no right to attend the executive session unless they're, you know, they're involved in the due process um, kind of situation. And then I would only allow that employee to attend um, on the advice of your attorney. Uh, the employee um, does have the right though to the minutes of the executive session for, in which they were discussed. Uh, superintendent evaluations, those are also done under the employee uh, matters exception make sure that the evaluation is, uh, is limited to personal performance of the superintendent and you don't have an extended conversation about the attainment of district goals and, and programs that you know, really are kind of strategic goals. 
that really should be in open session. Uh, if you're going to have an executive session for legal advice, make sure your attorney is there or by phone and then that you're directing all the discussion through your attorney. And once that advice has been rendered, that you then go back into open session. Uh, if you're going to be in uh, having an executive session for uh, giving instruction to a negotiating representative, make sure that you're not having some long discussion about, you know, budgets and things like that to sort of set the stage for what instruction you're going to give, because those again are, are should be open session discussions. Uh, you also have to have minutes for your executive sessions. And those have to have all the elements that a regular minutes have, date, time, and location, who was there, a general description of everything considered. And then the review of the executive session minutes, however, is limited. So they're confidential. They're kept at the district office. They can be seen by public body members, the employee who was discussed, if it's an employee matters uh, issue, or then, you know, you know auditor general, or you know, county attorney or AG if there's an open meeting law investigation. So um, uh, there is one other, we said we had nine uh, reasons for having an executive session. There's actually a 10th reason. And the reason we don't include that in those nine reasons is because um, this is a Title 15 um, uh, education code uh, allowance to have an executive session. That is student hearings, on student promotion or retention and student uh, disciplinary matters. Those can be done in an executive session, but they're not part of the open meeting law because of course, not every other public body in this state has to deal with it. So it's actually in the education code. Um, so, uh, and, and understand that the rules are a little different because what we care about here is not the public interest as much. What we're caring about here is the interest of the students and their privacy interests and the interests of the parents. and Unlike in other situations, in almost every instance, if you're talking about a student, the student has the right to be there, the parent has the right to be there, and they can have that discussion in public if they want to. If it's a promotion or retention issue, um, the parent um, can request the public meeting and the teacher has to be informed. Um, if it's based on their recommendation, they have the right to attend uh, the executive session as well. Uh, but if it's a student disciplinary matter, um, Typically speaking, most student hearings, uh, if it's a hearing on a student disciplinary matter, most of those are going to hearing officers these days. And then what you deal with on the board is the recommendation of the hearing officer. That's also done in an executive session. That also has to, you also have to notice the parent that you're gonna be talking about that. And they also have the right to attend or alternatively, they can, they can decide that they want that discussion in public. Um, they could record you as well. So just completely different when you're dealing with student disciplinary matters, the onus uh, and, the, and the concern that we have is there for student um, privacy. Uh, the board can meet in an emergency session. Um, that is a meeting with less than 24 hour notice. And um, if, it, if it's something that the board has to do that, that re re requires a sudden response. Um, and we did have a number of those around the state um, last year when COVID hit. Um, so you, they could happen, uh, but you have to know that if you do uh, have an emergency session, it does have to be a bona fide emergency. That's not just, you know, because of some logistical issue that you were going to lose them, you know, lose a board member and not have a quorum on a particular day. Um, you have to post the notice and the agenda as soon as you can. You have to put the details of why, you know, what the emergency was at the meeting and put those details in the minutes and then post within 24 hours of, uh, um, of the details of the emergency. Uh, so what happens if you violate the open meeting law um, and somebody points it out that we believe you violated the open meeting law? Well, there are a couple, you know, we'll get to the penalties uh, in a second, but one of the um, things that happen when you violate the open meeting law, perhaps inadvertently, is that it's, it, it serves to invalidate the action that you took. In other words, Say you, 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 um, you, know, you had defective notice at that meeting and you, the board took a number of actions and somebody pointed out, hey, you have defective notice. Well, it's though, as though that board did not take any of those actions that they said. But 
the board, once they've been put on notice that they may have violated the notice requirements, can ratify those decisions if it's if it, they occur within 30 days after the violation, they were put on vi violation that a notice had that a violation may have occurred. Um, and then you they basically you put in the minutes that this is based on a prior action, and what you're doing is legally curing um, that prior action. You just it, you have your attorney work through that because it's very specific if you find yourself in that situation. So the penalties of for open meeting law can be severe. Um, most importantly, I always tell everybody is that it, it, it has a tendency to erode public trust in the institution. And I, I think that that's really the, the biggest um, penalty that we have. Uh, that's certainly what we something we don't want to do um, as public officials. But the AG is the primary, um, the Attorney General is the primary um, uh, enforcer of the open meeting law. <clears throat> there is, however, authorities for the uh, county attorney to, to uh, enforce it, as well as a um, right of a private citizens to go to court and enforce it. The violations are $500 per violation for a knowing um, violation of aiding, uh, uh, agreeing to aid or attempting to aid another person in violation. There is no uh, insurance coverage or district indemnity for this. It comes out of your own pocket. And then second offenses are $2,500 fine per violation. Uh, a couple of years ago, we put in law um, something that I think had always been the case, um, which is that if you happen to be the one or two board members that are objecting and believing that the open meeting law is being violated, and you state on the record that you believe it's being violated, and you take action to try not to, be, to, to not be part of that violation, well, there's going to be um, sort of special di dispensation for you uh, in terms of leniency um, in enforcement. And we did, you know, it's been a number of years. I always just tell people just not just to scare you, but because it's true. Um, back in, I believe it was 1998, we had a, an entire board that was um, it resigned from their board. It was a large district in the Phoenix area um, uh, for violations of the open meeting law. And it was uh, a, an ugly mess. And um, I don't think it's anything that any other board would like to repeat. Um, most of the time, uh, if there is an allegation of a, uh, a violation of the open meeting law, the attorney general's office will urge you to get more training because they do understand that this is a tough law to sometimes understand and to, to follow. And so they want to help people to, to understand it better. So that is why I have done, just finished my 12th presentation of the year <laughs> because it is one that uh, boards need to take seriously. And I commend you for, for doing that today. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that um, may you may have that came along the way. I have some questions. Oh, wonderful. Um, I wrote that. I was going. <laughs> On the notice, Chris, um, yes. when we we're talking about where the public notice has to be done, um, is it different if you're having a quorum? Like, do you, um, I think right now you said we have like a blanket statement for quorums. Do you have to post each event? Like, say we're all going to the spelling bee. Yeah. Is that the same as posting the notice for our board meetings? Yeah. So remember I mentioned that, that in order for the open meeting law to apply and for you to have a meeting, you have to have a quorum plus a discussion of board business. Sure. Um, so if you all go to spelling bee, if you just go there to witness the spelling bee and to support the spelling bee and you don't talk to one another, we don't have a violation of the open meeting law. Um, it's not a meeting, but understanding that everybody wants to sort of be above board and, and to put the public on notice that you understand the rules, oftentimes districts will do uh, what they call a soft posting, whether well, they will list a, a series of, of um, you know, district level activities or school activities where a quorum of board members may be in attendance, but there will be no board business discussed. Okay. Um, they do that because they put the public on notice that, you know, if you see the majority of board members here, understand it's not a board meeting, but you know, 
we understand what the rules are. And, and that's, uh, that's advisable. It's a good idea. It's not required under the law. And so I was actually had a question about that, Chris, also. Um, uh, I got my verbiage from one of the gentlemen in your office. I can't remember his name right now. Um, but it does specifically say something like uh, for school events such as, and then I listed a bunch of different things. If, if that if that event isn't there, like they did a, um, an essay luncheon, a rewards or awards luncheon the other day, but that was a school event, very similar in, in type to the events that I had listed. So I didn't do a separate posting. Is that okay? Or does that yeah. event specifically need to be listed? No, I, I don't think it needs to be listed. Listen, again, remember, I, I think it's a good idea, but it, it, when you know about it in advance, but if you, if you don't or you missed it, as long as board, business, board members didn't talk to one another, there's no violation. Okay. And then my other question was um, regarding public comments. And you were talking about, you know, the board can adopt and enforce reasonable time uh, place and manner regulations, but to make sure that it, it's consistent across the board. So sometimes we have one public comment, but obviously if they're, you know, if it's a hot topic, we may have 10 public comments. So when it's one public comment, we kind of like listen to their comment, but if it's 10 public comments in the past, we've given them maybe three minutes each. Can you do that like based on per meeting or do we always have to say everybody has three minutes? Well, my advice is that it that it be the same in each instance, uh, and that that be part of um, either you know clearly stated on the speaker cards that you have people fill out, fill out, or read at the beginning of the call of the public, but that it be the expectation, um, no matter how many people sign up. Okay. I think that would be all the We're good on our side. Okay. Dana, do you have any questions? Nope. I'm good, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, no, thank you guys uh, for having me. And uh, let me know. Um, one thing I will say is, um, you know, I, I do take a lot of open me law questions. I can't be your lawyer. And I certainly would point you to call your lawyer if I think it's something that you've got, uh, uh, you need to get legal advice about but I certainly give a lot of information about the open meeting law, um, usually on a prospective basis. So please uh, feel free to utilize um, that service if you, if you need to. Thank you, Chris, for presenting this meeting for us. You are welcome.